fear of public speaking, I am actually uh, pretty excited to be here today. And uh, one of the reasons why is because uh, I really enjoy what I do. And I thought it would be great to kind of share that, uh, share a little bit of, of why I enjoy what I do. So as I mentioned, I head up uh, the new product development and innovation team at Simcor. And for those of you who don't know who Simcor is, uh, Simcor is a private entity. We're a joint venture that's owned by three of lar uh, Canada's largest financial institutions, which includes RBC Bank, Bank of Montreal, and TD Bank. And we were formed just over 20 years ago. And the reason why we were formed is that they want to gain some efficiencies through their back office processing. There were things that they did in-house that were very paper intensive, that were process intensive, that they thought, you know, let's create this uh, entity that can do this for us. And um, I get to uh, work, though, on the cool, new, and innovative stuff, that everything that's digital and data, AI, and ML related. It's kind of like being a, an enterprise startup without having to worry so much about what your valuation is or where your next round of funding is coming from, which is kind of cool. And I thought it would be important to share with you one of the things that we're doing uh, through Simcor and through my team, which I call Core IQ. Um, one of the first things that we're doing as part of that new business development and innovation is actually igniting a paradigm shift in terms of how Canadian institutions better detect and prevent against uh, fraud and financial crimes, which are a significant issue not only in Canada but globally. Um, and w I thought I'd share with you one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about what I do, and, and this is essentially uh, the reason why. It's uh, because I have one of these. I have a, uh, a teenage son. Now, my son is a, is a digital baby. By the time my son was born, uh, Google was already four years old. Uh, Facebook was officially launched uh, just three short years later. And then in the next two years, we were all introduced to the very first version of the smartphone. So my son, uh, like other teens his age, um, lives his entire life online. He lives in a hyper-digital, hyper-connected hyper world. And for, for that reason, he and others like him happen to make um, an ideal target uh, for cyber fraudsters. And so working uh, against uh, those cyber criminals is one of the reasons why I do what I do. And it's, a, it's an impact that is pretty significant. Uh, they actually make for, children and teens make for a, a big target for cyber criminals. In 2017, it was estimated that fraud impacts against children uh, will total nearly $3 billion uh, globally. So that's significant. In fact, uh, kids under 18 are 51% more likely to be the victims of identity theft than adults. So why is that? Uh, why are they a target? I mean, kids don't have any money, right? Well, the reality is that uh, children's identities provide a blank slate for criminals to do what they do best, which is assume identities and take over accounts and acquire increasingly large amounts of credit and and debt uh, in their names, debt which they have no intent of paying back. And children like my son uh, make for an ideal target because you know, they're, they're so used to sharing their information, uh, sharing their information online, but they're not the only ones. Like we're all in that boat, same boat, right? We're all social and digital creatures. We all readily share personal information that be can be considered very sensitive online. Like this guy who's innocently sharing a picture of his newly acquired driver's license, right? And so there's my name, my address, my date of birth, here you go, cyber fraudster, <laughs> on a silver platter. So it's not just kids, uh, it's adults as well. How many of you have social media accounts, right? And what's my pet's name? Where was I born? What's, you know, what's my maiden name? Really critical personal information. You know all those two-factor authentication questions that you get asked when you're logging on to banking? That's what you just gave to the criminals. Uh, the other methods that they use are data breaches, data breaches where we all put our you know, credentials and because we're, if you're lazy like I am, you use the same password across many accounts. The second a data breach happens, your data has been acquired and that can be used to log into your account and take it over. And then there's scams like phishing. So all of these are just simple techniques uh, that are used by very sophisticated cyber criminals to conduct what they do. In fact, uh, I think it's important to note that they are sophisticated criminals on the other end. One UN study uh, recently noted that 80% of cybercrime actually comes from organized criminal activity. And so something that is so natural to a teen like my son, who something that's been around from day one, which is digital and data and sharing information, um, doesn't seem foreign to them, doesn't seem something that they should protect against, which is where folks like myself and my team uh, come in. 
And while you and I may think that we're pretty uh, technically savvy, I'd argue that we're not in protecting our data. Certainly uh, folks like my, my son and, and teens and children like him are no match from the sophisticated criminals who are on the other end. And so uh, my team and I have been asking oursel ourselves uh, for the last several years, what can we do? How can we help organizations like, uh, like RBC, uh, like our other customers' banks? How can we help, you know, more importantly, ordinary consumers like you and I and children like my son protect themselves against this criminal uh, activity? And so one of the things that we've done is um, we knew that there was a big issue and a big problem in front of us. And so to tackle this big issue, we actually went small. We created a small, dedicated team of resources that uh, work very much like an enterprise startup uh, within this, the broader SimCorp organization. We're collaborative, we're transparent, we, uh, we're very agile, uh, but we're backed by a pretty large organization. But we knew, it, that, so that was one part, we created dedicated agile teams, and the second part was we knew that we couldn't fight this problem alone. And so we engaged some of the largest and best uh, financial crime fighters in the country, and that's the banks themselves. Much like one of the other presenters, we engaged in a number of meetups and summits and hackathons and POCs and trials that brought the banks together to collaborate together. And we're kind of a neutral third party who's facilitating safe uh, collaboration while being respectful for all the privacy and the security rules that come with that uh, within those financial institutions. It's what we like to call a little bit of a justice league, a justice league of fraud fighters who are working against these uh, hyper-sophisticated criminals. And then the last thing that we've been doing is we've been equipping, uh, equipping some of our superheroes or our Justice League with one of the most powerful tools out there, and that's artificial intelligence and machine learning. So the power of AI and ML to process significant amounts of data is, it data is what our real nirvana is. And we're able to do that across a data set that cuts across channels and cuts across financial institutions. So it's pretty a, a exciting time uh, for us and one of the reasons why we're, we're after this is because the actual uh, profits that some of these criminals engender from cybercrime are expected to um, total nearly $1.5 trillion this year alone, rising as high as $6 trillion in just a few short years. So the reason criminals are after this is because there's a big pot at the end of it, and it's important that we do something, uh, something about it. And that's, that's what excites me, and that's something that I'm very passionate about is uh, the ability to do something that has um, an impact that is national, uh, that has an impact to do some good with data and help not only individuals like us, but also help uh, teens like my son. Thank you. <laughs> Who wants to question? So um, cybersecurity is one of those things where you could potentially argue that you can't spend enough money. Oh, that's me. Sorry, right, I'm here. Sorry. I'll stand up. It was like there's a voice. Yeah, there you go. I'm like <laughs> ominous. <laughs> Do you, is there any guideline you have in terms of like um, percent of budget that people should be spending or like something that suggests too little spending as an organization for cybersecurity or too much spending? Is there any insight you can provide on that? Yeah, um, maybe an unfair question because I'm a vendor that's kind of <laughs> selling in this space. Uh, spend all the money that you can, right? <laughs> but uh, it's actually a problem. So one of the, the hardest things that we've found is we're actually forming an alliance which actually is incremental to the work that we do today amongst Canada's largest institutions. And every quarter you're hearing about the, how they beat the market expectations. They've got billions of dollars in profit every quarter. And then you go at them and you say, you gotta spend a little bit of money, uh, but you know, the impacts are huge. Look at, all, look at how much uh, these criminals are, 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 are doing and spending. And you get faced with the question of, well, you know, I'm a cost center, I just don't have a budget. Uh, so I think we don't spend enough and we don't recognize um, you know, the, the true cost. So in terms of a percentage, I can't share a number with you, but <laughs> it's gonna be in the multi-millions of dollars that you need to be spending. And um, I think that's where you have a benefit from working in an alliance, like the one that we're trying to form, is don't try to do it on your own. Uh, because the criminals aren't working in silos, and so there's benefit to using um, shared resources from multiple organizations to kind of work together. So uh, I think that's something that you can do when you're facing a, a constraint in terms of funding. Hi. Uh, hello, uh, very interesting talk, and I also have three kids that are totally sucked into the matrix <laughs> with the iPads and everything. Anyone who's been interviewing 
anywhere in the tech industry anywhere in the last five years has probably heard we're pretty casual around here is the first thing they hear when they walk into the office. Mm. Would we're pretty casual around here be helping the bad guys in indirectly? Uh, you mean uh, casual in terms of internally and everybody's casual. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I've seen directors <laughs> and flip flops. I've seen it all. <laughs> right? Is yeah. that attitude helping the bad guys? Uh, well, I, I mean, <laughs> I don't know. I think there's lots of benefits to wearing uh, to being comfortable in what you wear um, and uh, in the environment that you're in. Um, I'm I'm dressed like this only because I had another speaking engagement. Otherwise, I'd much rather be in jeans. Uh, I, so I don't I don't equate that necessarily to the attitude. I don't know if I misunderstood your question. It's the attitude, yeah. So I, I think uh, it's certainly um, I don't think it's necessarily that that's the issue. I think we are so comfortable sharing information that we shouldn't be so comfortable sharing, oversharing in many cases, right? Like. I was giving my team a hard time because I was speaking at one event and they actually posted on LinkedIn, you know, come see Saba on this date at 3.15. I'm like, don't, don't tell people where I'm going to be at 3.15. They know that I'm not at home, right? So it's information like that that we just, we just don't think because it's more about the social gratification of letting people know what we're doing. Um, and, and so I would say that's more the concern is that as social digital creatures, um, we're a little too lax, um, and it's complex, right? How many of you have just one bank account? Like there, uh, you probably have uh, banking relations across multiple institutions in one way or another, so it's hard to keep track of some of those credentials and that information. So the more digital we get, the more connected we get, the more difficult uh, it is to do some of those things. So. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Well. They're they're casual inside the bank because if they're not, they're gonna you know be disrupted by a fintech, right? So they all have to have. <laughs> that's that's why. <laughs> so uh, uh, no, I don't. I, I I I wouldn't say that. I mean, we don't see that in any of the security teams. I'm gonna tell you that the the fraud and the financial crimes teams that we come across are very smart, very sophisticated, very passionate. So I don't see them um, being lax with any of the security measures they take against um, protecting customers' data, because that's reputation at the end of the day. So I, I certainly haven't experienced that attitude, and I've sat across from a number of CISOs, a number of uh, uh, you know, heads of fraud and financial crimes. Um, so that's, that's just my perspective. So <laughs> we can talk afterwards. Yeah. Yes? Yeah, great question. Open banking, How, to what extent will open banking affect our business model? So open banking, in, in, in from my perspective, is the requirement for um, you know data to be available, your right to your own data, uh, the right to be forgotten, and things like that. So I don't think it will impact negatively our business model. In fact, I think through open banking, you're going to need someone like us who is able to see um, not only identities but perhaps transactions across the various silos and give a level of certainty. So when open banking and GDPR happened in Europe and payments modernization happened in Europe, the fraud rates went through the roof. Uh, and part of the reason that is that uh, the information was a little too accessible. And so I, th I don't th see it disrupting. I, in fact, I think more, more than ever, you're going to need a model that actually can evaluate risk ac across multiple entities. So. Hi. So outside of, uh, you know, having you walk into a TD branch every time you want to open a credit card, <laughs> is yeah. there, where, where, where does the solution lie? Like, where is this headed? Uh, and I think that's exactly the issue. So the question was, given that the bureaus are so compromised, given that data everywhere, really, through data breaches is so compromised, what do you do outside of a physical walking into a branch, which actually isn't necessarily a nirvana, because that's what the fraudsters do. They find an open channel, and they'll go after it. I think this is about being able to analyze the relevant data sources across as many points uh, as you can. So to truly use the power of artificial intelligence and machine learning, first it's about entity resolution, truly identifying an individual without too many false positives, and then being able to pick the right data points um, that even if bureau data is compromised, you have an alternative source of data that you can use to validate that individual and that entity. And I think that's what financial institutions have to focus on.
How come I'm getting all the questions? <laughs> Not that I mind. <laughs> one more, one more. Yep. Thank you. find that more you get more people coming to you after it's too late like after the breach has happened versus they're being preventative and in that same vein when you go to acquire a new business do you find that a big part of the narrative you have to tell unfortunately is like a horror story yeah yeah so um is it is it too late are they coming to us too late and i think i think the willingness to collaborate the willingness to work with a, an organization like us has kind of always been there. Uh, the issue has been, um, it hasn't been, perce been perceived as big enough a problem. But in the last uh, year, like how many data breaches have you heard about? They're all over the news. So it's kind of working to our favor, but not necessarily. And that's not something that I ever hoped for. I think the sophistication that's out there in terms of the cyber criminals capabilities is certainly lending itself to more of a focus on this. So it's not intentional by any means. I think it's just a reality because um, the digital banking relationships have changed, right? So that's changed how people perceive individuals and entities, and it's required people to react very differently. And it's happened like this. It's been a scale that's been um, significant and happened really quickly over the last little while. So um, it is unfortunate that sometimes that, uh, that the organizations who engage us are engaging us after the issue is almost a little bit too late. But I don't think it's too late at this time. I think we have to, we have to start, we have to, we have to get at some of these issues um, now. Thank you.